This week on the podcast, we talk the CFMEU's housing plan, Russian anti-war activist Boris Kargolitsky's arrest, and the Women's World Cup. This podcast was recorded on stolen land. Green Left is committed to supporting struggles for First Nations justice. Welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. I'm Isaac Nellist and today I'm joined by Chloe. Welcome back on the show. Thanks, Isaac. Good to be back. And today uh, we've got some a uh, few good stories. So we'll kick it off with this new plan from the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union to end the housing crisis by introducing a super profits tax on corporations with turnovers uh, greater than $100 million. So the tax would raise $28 billion a year that's required for affordable housing by 2041. And over 10 years, $290 billion could be raised from mining companies and $163 billion from non-mining companies. So the CFMEU launched this plan uh, at the National Press Club on July 25. And according to figures provided by Oxford Economics Australia, there's a shortfall of more than 750,000 affordable dwellings across the country, which is expected to rise to 1 million if nothing is done. And the CFMEU's plan follows recent polling by the Australian Institute's Centre for Future Work, which found that 66% of people believe corporate profits are what's driving inflation, not wages. So the CFMEU is preparing a national campaign, end the housing crisis, tax super profits, and wants the plan to be debated at Labor's national conference in August. It's so good to see the CFMEU leading the discussion with this plan and, and this initiative, which the left should support. The housing crisis is dire and Labor governments continue to demolish public housing. And Margaret Kelly, the last remaining tenant at the Barack Beacon public housing estate in Port Melbourne, which is set to be demolished or demolition has 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 begun uh, and has been given uh, an eviction or Margaret Kelly has been given an eviction date. Kelly told a vigil outside Victorian Parliament on July 20th that she has been ordered to move by August 7th or risk being forcibly removed. Protesters have been occupying Barack Beacon to protect it from demolition since July 9th. Margaret said she's looking into her options. Yeah, that's very sad news that uh, Margaret's being forced to uh, be evicted and we're following the fight very closely here in Gaddy or Sydney where the campaigns to save public housing are growing in strength. At the time of recording today, uh, Green Left held a housing forum uh, last night uh, with Margaret in in Nam, um, and another's being held on uh, August 1st in Gaddy with uh, Greens MP Max Chandler-Matha joining via Zoom and a bunch of other uh, great speakers. So come along to that if you can. I think the details will be in the description. Another forum was held by Action for Public Housing on July 18 to discuss alternatives to the demolition of public housing. More than 100 people attended in person and online. Uh, Speakers included housing campaigners and experts such as Dr. Hans Frickham from the School of Architecture, Design and Planning at Sydney Uni, Ian Stevenson from the Glebe Society, Emily Valentine from Hands Off Glebe, Hector Abrahams, the architect of the Wentworth Park Road public housing estate, and Simon Robinson and Steve Minton from Office Architects in NAM. And all these speakers spoke about different models of retaining, renovating and upgrading public housing rather than just knocking it down and kicking people out of their homes. Um, So that full forum is available online uh, on Action Public Housing's social media pages. But while we're on the topic of public housing, some sad news as a resident of the Franklin Street Estate in Glebe in Sydney was killed by police on July 19 during a welfare check. The 43-year-old man was tasered and shot after allegedly wielding a knife, uh, but the killing follows on from other excessive use of force by police, including the killing of Claire Nowland, who was the 95-year-old woman with dementia who was tasered by police in May. And earlier in July, 50-year-old Aboriginal man was repeatedly punched and kicked by police officers outside Kings Cross Station. And in May, Constable Ryan Barlow was found guilty of assault after slamming a 16-year-old Indigenous boy to the ground and pinning him to the floor with his knee. So rest in peace uh, to all those who have killed and solidarity uh, with the victims of police violence. 
On the topic of police, a crackdown on domestic violence in July resulted in the arrest of almost 600 people in New South Wales. Operation Amarok is being promoted as an intelligence-based policing strategy targeting perpetrators of domestic and family violence. New South Wales Police Deputy Commission Mel Lanyon called on the New South Wales government to enact harsher punishments against perpetrators of domestic violence. However, women's rights organisations are concerned about the law and order approach. Tara Hunter from Full Stop Australia told the ABC that giving police more powers will not mean fewer offences. She said the results of the police operation indicated the failings of apprehended domestic violence orders across New South Wales. She called the suggestion to increase police powers a simplistic response to a complex issue. Sadly, figures from our watch show that on average, one woman a week is murdered by her current or former partner. 33 women have been killed so far this year. Protest calling for the Talisman Sabre War Games to be cancelled was held in Gaddy on July 19. And we've talked about the Talisman Sabre on the podcast before, but if you're not sure what it is, it's this massive military exercise which the US and Australian militaries are conducting. This year it's involving more than 30,000 troops, which is designed to further integrate Australia into the US war machine. It also involves heaps of other countries sending um, troops as well. So the protesters said that the war games will cost millions of dollars and threaten peace and security in the Asia-Pacific region. And the protest was organised by the Australian Anti-Basis Campaign and the Sydney Anti-Orcus Coalition. The anti-war movement is growing stronger, as evidenced by a packed-out forum at Redfern Town Hall on July 23rd, also organised by the Sydney Anti-Orcus Co- Coalition and supported by the Independent and Peaceful Australia Network. The massive turnout for the event shows that the AUKUS military pact between Australia, the US and Britain is deeply unpopular. A range of speakers discussed why Australia is further integrating itself with the US war machine and the drive to war against China, including Wajiri and school climate strike organiser Ethan Lyons, human rights activist Stuart Rees, Tina Smith from the South Coast Labor Council, Alison Bronowiski from Australians for War Powers Reform and Marcus Strom from Labor Against War. After a lively discussion, Sydney Anti-Orcus Coalition activist Pip Hinman, who chaired the meeting, put a successful resolution calling on Labor to withdraw from AUKUS and develop peaceful relations with all countries in the Asia-Pacific, spend the money designated for nuclear subs on the urgent climate transition, listen to First Nations communities who do not want nuclear waste stored on their country, and to sign the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Yeah, those are all really important points, um, particularly the, the campaign to stop nuclear waste being dumped on First Nations land which had a win on July 18 as a federal court judgment blocked the construction of a radioactive waste dump near Kimber on South Australia's Eyre Peninsula. There's still a chance that Labor could appeal the decision, but it looks unlikely, and the $325 million Kimber project is widely believed to be dead. Um, Jason Bilney from the Bangala Determination Aboriginal Corporation, who has been leading the fight, the three-year fight to stop the dump, described the decision as a victory for all First Nations people. Uh, The Bangala legal challenge began in 2021 and was supported by demonstrations outside of courtrooms, but in recent months, campaigners were beginning to lose hope as legal options were running out. However, the judge's decision was a thrilling surprise, uh, ruling that the dump proposal was not consistent with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and Bilney said that the result was about truth-telling, quote, Bangala fought for 21 years over native title rights over our land, including Kimber, and we weren't going to stop fighting. Truth-telling 
is what led us to today. We are proud. The Women's World Cup began on July 20th with a record crowd of more than 75,000 people watching the Matildas take on the Republic of Ireland. It is great to see women's sports skyrocketing in popularity in recent years, but there is, there are still clear disparities between how women's and men's sports are treated. While the incredible skills and talent of the players is inspiring to watch, what is equally inspiring is the action they are taking um, off the pitch to fight for fair treatment. The prize money for this World Cup is a quarter of what the men's game gets and the Matildas have vowed to address this after the games. In 2015, the Matildas went on strike with the support of the Professional Footballers Australia Union and won, securing equal pay in 2019. There are lots of contradictions between the inspiring actions of the players and the often corrupt and inhumane ways FIFA and other companies behind the scenes act. Yeah, a great example of this is the World Cup bid by Spain, Portugal and Morocco for the 2030 World Cup. While there's nothing inherently wrong with these countries hosting the World Cup, the bid includes a stadium in Western Sahara, which is a non-self-governing territory that's illegally occupied by Morocco. The Australian Western Sahara Association protested near the World uh, Women's World Cup match between Morocco and Germany on July 24, calling for an end to sports washing. Morocco is guilty of killing civilians with drones, and they're attempting to use sports to cover up these atrocities. A letter was sent to FIFA President Gianni Infantino from European Union MPs across 13 countries and five political groups, suggesting that holding international events such as football matches in occupied territories could contravene international law. More than 100 community and union activists turned out on the steps of Geelong Town Hall on July 25th to say no room for racism. They mobilised in response to provocative media coverage of a small, NAM Melbourne-based Nazi group which had posed in front of the town hall and the local Office of the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union, the CFMEU, and Maritime Union of Australia, the MUA, the previous week. The rally was initiated by the community in newly elected city of Greater Geelong, Councillor Sarah Hathaway's first consultation in Norlin. Residents decided at that meeting to organise publicly for tolerance and diversity in response to racism. Hathaway told Green Left that it shows that even a small group of residents getting together, talking through an issue and taking initiative can have a broader impact. And now let's hear what's happening around the world. The Russian regime has taken the internationally renowned Marxist sociologist and anti-war socialist Boris Kargolitsky into custody on the trumped-up charge of justifying terrorism. He faces the possibility of up to seven years jail if found guilty, and the decision to detain him until his hearing in late September was made within a day of his arrest in Moscow on July 25, in a closed court and without his lawyer present. Kagalitsky's arrest is a politically motivated attack against one of the most vocal critics of Russian President Vladimir Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. It's also part of a broader campaign to clamp down on anti-war dissidents in Russia. From the day the invasion began on February 24, 2022, Kagalitsky and the online leftist media platform he edits, uh, Rabcor, have played a key role in anti-war activities and propaganda. For this, Kagalitsky was labelled a foreign agent by the Russian state as early as May 2022. And speaking to Green Left last year, he explained how this label is used to intimidate anti-war activists. 
He said, everyone knows that the next step after being labeled a foreign agent is that you're put in jail, which is why many have left. Rabcor and supporters launched an international appeal for support, and there are details on the Green Left article online to donate to the campaign. It's really important that we show our solidarity. The Spanish election took place on July 23, called early by Spanish Socialist Workers' Party Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez after the disastrous outcome of the May 28 regional and local elections and was presented as one of the most crucial in recent history. The recent the result was that the right-wing People Party and Islamophobic Vox were held at bay with participation up by 4.2% on the last election to 70.4%. The right fell 6 seats short of the 176 seats needed to win government. The result depended on whether the millions of working, welfare dependent and poor people would mobilise against the reactionary right, despite the recent drop in living standards that would normally have doomed the ruling party, and they did. Read the full report by Green Left's European correspondent Dick Nichols, who is based in Barcelona, at greenleft.org.au. A powerful online protest has succeeded in stopping pharmaceutical corporation Johnson & Johnson from enforcing secondary patents on a critical drug used to treat multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. But Aquiline is on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines, and Johnson & Johnson had wanted to extend its secondary patent on Bedaquiline, which is marketed as Saturo, um, which would have prevented generic manufacturers from developing more affordable versions of the treatment until 2027. If Johnson & Johnson had not been forced to withdraw, people would have had to pay an estimated 70% more for their life-saving drugs. And the idea that this drug is the intellectual pro- property of a private company is only true in a legal sense the drug was actually developed with publicly funded research via grants from the United States government's National Institute of Health. The campaign against corporations' profit gouging has helped bring a decisive win for people living with TV, although more needs to be done. Lindsay McKenna, who's the co-director of the TB project at Treatment Action Group, said the new licensing agreement hasn't done anything to dismantle or even acknowledge how insidious the practice of patent evergreening is. She said these secondary patents are an issue across the board for lots of drugs that should be considered public goods. The Socialist Party of Malaysia, PSM, and the Malaysian United Democracy Alliance, or MUDA, have agreed on an electoral pact for the upcoming state assembly elections on August 12. This pact, which was announced on July 15, commits the two parties not to stand candidates against each other and to campaign on five key shared concerns. The first of these is a rejection of race-based politics, which has become a dominant and toxic feature of politics in Malaysia since the 1970s, and the left-wing opposition Socialist Front was repressed and its leaders jailed without trial under the notorious Internal Security Act. The pact says that Muda and PSM represent Malaysians who are multiracial, ethnic and religious. We believe the rhetoric of mainstream politics centred around race and ethnicity is archaic and must be replaced with needs-based policies. The two parties have also committed to uplifting the lives of the majority and marginalised people, to genuine uh, democracy balanced and inclusive development, and for urgent environmental action. Tens of thousands of Peruvians took to the streets across the country on July 19 to protest the Dina Balwate coup government. Balwate assumed the presidency in December following a legislative coup against leftist President Pedro Castillo, who remains in preventative detention after making an alliance with right-wing parties in Congress. Thousands marched to the capital, the third Toma de Lima, uh, which means takeover of Lima, since Castillo was ousted, marking the first of 10 days of national action called by called for by unions and grassroots organizations until Peru's Independence Day on July 28. Protesters called for Beluate's 
resignation, the closure of the right-wing controlled Congress, Castillo's release and a constituent assembly to draft a new constitution. About 24,000 police were deployed across the country and violently attacked many of the peaceful protests, firing tear gas into crowds and harassing and beating up Indigenous Aymara women on July 22nd. Popular support for the protest movement is growing, with a recent survey finding 58% of people identified with the anti-government protests. The Escalasticas community in Querétaro State, Mexico, has been subjected to extreme police repression, with 11 people initially arrested in June and three still detained. Around 300 state and local police surrounded the community on June 13, stopping people from entering or leaving, and police fired tear gas and threw rocks at community members, as well as using dogs to disperse people and beating and intimidating female protesters. Of the 11 people arrested that day, five suffered severe injuries such as bruising and fractures. Last year, Querétaro State joined Puebla City in effectively privatizing water in violation of the Mexican constitution. As Mexico grapples with increasing droughts and water scarcity, transnational and local companies are trying to access water to either sell it directly or to use it for car, clothing and soft drink production, among other industries, at the expense of residents and small farmers. In Escolasticas, companies have been operating in cahoots with public security forces and paramilitaries to intimidate locals, and the community has been holding protests to demand the release of the three people still detained, including rallies on July 19th and 25th. The weeks-long strike of more than 7,400 dock workers, members of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union Canada, the ILWU, at 30 ports in British Columbia, took another strange turn on July 19th. The ILWU tentatively ended its strike on July 13th, then resumed the strike and picketed on July 18th, followed following a decision by its internal caucus not to send a government-mediated proposed agreement to members for ratification. The union then quietly took down picket lines only hours later and ended the strike. The, the decision to end the strike followed ominous moves by the federal government by the federal government and the Canadian Industrial Relations Board, the federal body that administers Canada's labour code and oversees industrial relations in the federal private sector. The Industrial Relations Board controversially ruled that the resumption of the strike was illegal because the union had failed to provide 72 hours notice, treating it as a new strike. This move suggests the board is taking a more aggressive anti-union, anti-strike approach which threatens future industrial action by unions if upheld. Faced with the additional threat of back-to-work legislation being introduced, the ILWU decided to take the very deal it had rejected to members for ratification. The vote will come some days after a scheduled meeting with its members. This result can only be understood as the outcome of a concerted attack on the union, one with dangerous implications for working class organising. Under threat, the union leadership caved to these pressures to hawk the deal to members. Members know the deal is a bad one since even the leadership has already rejected it. And you can read more about all of these stories, plus videos, detailed analysis and book and music reviews at greenleft.org.au. Rallies, forums and vigils are taking place around the country to say no more Hiroshima's, no more AUKUS on Hiroshima Day, August 6. On August 6 and 9 in 1945, the US detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, killing between 129 to 226,000 people, mostly civilians. Join these rallies to say never again and protest the AUKUS alliance, nuclear subs and the drive to war against China. The rallies will take place on August 6 in Borloo or Perth at Perth Cultural Centre, in Gaddy at Sydney Town Hall at 2pm, Mianjin at King George Square at 2pm, Mullabimba in Newcastle at Hunter Peace Park at 11am, 
Tharawal or Wollongong at the Church on the Mall at 4pm, Tardanya or Adelaide at Makuda or Hindmau Square at 2pm, and on August 4 in Geelong at 5pm at Little Mallop Street Mall. You can find more details about all of these events at greenleft.org.au slash events. You can become a supporter for only $5 a month and donate to our 2023 Fighting Fund to help us make more content like this. Go to greenleft.org.au forward slash support to help us out. And remember to follow Green Left on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads and TikTok for the latest news and analysis. Thanks for listening. <laughs>